good news. Jesus has called us out of the grave. What direction are you heading? Are you stepping into the light? Praise God. That's uh, We gather here today to worship the Lord. So glad you're with us. Welcome to the journey. We're taking steps on the journey. That's why we're gathered here. And uh, hopefully you're taking steps too. Let's pray together. Will you join me? So thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity that we have today to step out of the grave to walk with you. Help us, God, to, to go in that positive direction, to step into the light, to be the light, to share the light. Jesus, help us. Thank you for the chance we have today to gather with your people, to gather in your presence, to worship your name, to experience the word together. We just ask that the Holy Spirit would have free reign in this place. We give you permission to have your way. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can take a seat for just a bit. Thanks for hanging out with us today on this Thanksgiving weekend. And um, we are taking steps together. And so glad you're part of the Journey family. If you're a guest here today, welcome. Glad to have you. Uh, speaking of taking steps, uh, we've got some folks taking steps uh, to membership. This weekend, it's, it's communion weekend. We'll be sharing that in a little while, uh, in just a, a little bit. Um, but we've got folks that are stepping into membership. Uh, Derek and Laura Eisenbraun. Let's see. I know they're here today. Laura's working in kids' church. Where's Derek? There's Derek right there. Uh, John and Amy Teske. Are you here? Nice. Nice to see you guys. We're excited to have new folks stepping in. We've got, uh, speaking of taking steps, uh, we've got opportunity to take steps in baptism in a few weeks, December 17th and 18th. We'll have a baptism service. Um, and so if you've never followed Jesus in believer baptism, uh, we would invite you to talk to one of the pastors. Love to get you set up for that. We've got some folks taking steps to Florida. We're actually going to take a plane. Uh, we've got 10 people from our church that, is gonna, that are going to go work with Samaritan's Purse down in the Fort Myers area, uh, helping with disaster relief down there. A lot of suffering folks. Um, matter of fact, uh, I'd like to recognize some of the team members. Uh, Derek, we get to point you out one more time. So Derek's heading with the team. Uh, who else is here that's on the Fort? Is it ben? ben Vitek, myself, I'm going. Anybody else? We got the Hadias. I don't see them here today. Donix, we're in first service. Joe Nelson, Levi Nelson, we've got 10 people. And I would just invite you to remember us in prayer, uh, help, that God would use us to be a blessing, that we would have divine appointments, opportunities to share the love of Jesus, the good news of Jesus uh, on our journey there. Um, I'm going to invite the ushers to come. We're going to receive our morning offering this morning. Thank you for your faithful giving. Uh, appreciate that. This is kind of the old-fashioned way to give. Uh, passing the plate. You can also give on our Journey app uh, through our website or through bill pay at, from your bank. And however you do it, God bless you. Uh, thank you for your support. If you are uh, just visiting today, this is this part is just on the house. Just let the plate pass on by. Uh, but our regular attenders, thank you for your, your uh, faithfulness and giving. I'm going to pray as we receive the offering. Will you join me in that? 
So thank you, God, for your goodness to us. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, the Father of heavenly lights. And, um, Lord, we just want to give back to you a portion of what you've given to us. Lord, may this be an act of worship, we pray. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, we do have kids' church happening for all of the littlest ones right now. And then in a little bit, there will be a light on the wall that will turn green. That's for elementary age kids to go to their ministry, which is in the family room. Uh, we have a family uh, Christmas event that's happening on December 11th. It's uh, an Advent adventure, and you can check out the bulletins for details on that. It goes from 3 until about 6 o'clock, um, and you can kind of come. It's open house. Come anytime. At 5 o'clock, we're going to have dinner together, and then we're going to sing some Christmas carols together. So that's going to be a great, great time. Uh, just kind of some family news. Uh, some of you might remember Neil Lottie, uh, member, uh, part of this church for many years. Neil passed away recently, and we'll be having his funeral service here on Wednesday um, at, at uh, 1 o'clock with a noon visitation. Um, so uh, we, we need to keep the Lottie family in our prayers. I'm just going to invite you to stand, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord, prepare our hearts for communion, and, um, and then for the message. Let's worship together.
When I survey the wondrous cross, is all which the Prince of Glory died. My riches.
gave his all for us. It's only appropriate and right that we give our all back to him. I'm going to invite you to have a seat while we uh, prepare for communion here. Folks that are serving can come this way. And uh, If you're a guest here, just a reminder, you don't have to be a member of Journey to share communion. Uh, we just ask that you would be a follower of Jesus. As we share together, it's also important to remember that um, you can just hang on to the elements and we'll, we'll uh, receive communion all together. Uh, but it, we're instructed in 1 Corinthians 11 to uh, examine ourselves as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. And um, that just means we should take this seriously, should be thinking about, you know, where are you at in your connection with Jesus, your relationship with him? How are you doing in honoring him with your life? So let's think about that as we sing a song to kind of help prepare our hearts. And then we'll receive together in just a few minutes. Where are you?
1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul is recalling uh, the Last Supper where Jesus had the Passover meal with his disciples. And it was by Jesus' example that we uh, practice communion even today. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, For I received from the Lord what I also passed unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us eat the bread together. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us drink the cup together. Just stand with me and we'll sing that chorus together one more time. Worship the Lord from your heart. Is that the cross and the cross I surrender my heart? Is that me? God, thank you for allowing us today to be together in your presence with these fine people you, you have called our family. We call each other friends. I ask God that the reading of your word, the talking about your word, the pondering about your word would bring about the change that your word is so intent upon. We are your people. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you have a seat today? So good to see you. And this holiday weekend, I uh, trust your Thanksgiving was was uh, was real good, and you were fed up by the time it was over. Uh, our Thanksgiving was uh, particularly enjoyable in that my oldest daughter had uh, had a baby on the day before. So uh, Ma Madeline Grace was born to Christiana. Some of you uh, remember Christiana. So um, if you'd open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 17, we'll, we're going we're gonna to talk about a uh, read, read through this uh, short story uh, that's commonly called the Tem Le Ten Lepers or the Leopard's Cleanse. Um, and let's just I'll tell you what, let's just, um, let's just read through the whole passage and then we'll talk about it. Verse 11 says, it came about that as he was on the way to Jerusalem, that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And he entered a certain village, 
um, let me just uh, just say Samaria. Samaria, whenever you read the word Samaria, that's a particular, it's something you should think about real, 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 uh, real hard. Because Samarians, or the Samarian people lived in Samaria, were the closest thing I can think of where the Bible um, identifies a marginalized group of people. A group of people that were, that were, um, were, were put down or looked down upon, thought less of, by the more powerful group, which would be the Jews. Um, now, we're gonna, not going to talk about social issues of the modern era um, today in church, but I thought it might be helpful if you knew uh, or reminded that you don't have to leave the Bible in order to find everything you need to know about social issues or how they matter to God. So if you look at the social issues of today, injustice, helping the poor, gender identity, all of those things, they're actually, they're actually instructed upon in the Scriptures. So today we're not going to talk. We're going to talk about giving thanks today, um, and the fact that a marginalized people or a marginalized person was the main character in the story shows you just where Jesus stands on the whole issue. Um, in a nutshell, whenever you read about a Samaritan in the Bible, the Samaritans were a poor group of people. They were what, what you would call perhaps a uh, half breeds. And, uh, and the Jews as a body of people looked down upon the Samaritans, didn't want anything to do with them, didn't like them. There was great anim animosity between them, hatred between them. And the Jews who should have known better because they were supposed to be the people of God should have treated them like God would. And Jesus is here to show them how they ought to be treated. So now that we got that out of the way, we'll just finish the passage. Because Jesus was going from here to there, we're not sure why. Maybe he was trying to get his steps in, um, checking his Fitbit. But he encountered ten people that were also doing the same thing. He entered a certain village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance. They met him and they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when, well let me just stop there. Because just as a leprosy, whenever you see the word leprosy or a leper in the Bible, there's something significant about it. Leprosy... Leprosy is, is, is a little bit different than what we know in the modern era about, about leprosy. I think they call it Hansen's disease now. In the Bible, the word leprosy was kind of a catch-all phrase or term for skin diseases or rashes. And, um, and it was a particular uh, rash or skin disease that was, was either growing or kind of uh, oozing or pussy or maybe scabbed and bleeding. And that would be termed an infectious um, disease or, a, or leprosy. Um, and it was they controlled those uh, infectious diseases in that day by quarantining. We know all about quarantining now, don't we? So they would, if you, the law says, the Bible says that if the priest said you had leprosy, then you had to immediately separate yourself from from the community, you had to be ostracized. You had to be, you had to go leave the village and stay away from people. The only people you could be with was other lepers, and 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 you know try to have a community there. That's why we call them leper colonies. There was ten of them here, and they stood at a distance because they weren't allowed among the people. They couldn't go to festival. They couldn't go to a Thanksgiving dinner. They couldn't go to they couldn't go to church. They couldn't hug their children. They couldn't kiss their wife. Not allowed. It was the law said stay away. Now, you know, we, we, we now have a number of these uh, infectious or rashes. It's nothing for us to get a really bad case of poison ivy or, or acne. I mean, I've had that or, or e eczema or any other number of skin diseases. So you know they're real, but in those days, can you imagine what it would have been like to have one of these diseases and to be ostracized, to be, to, to be, to, to be quarantined and isolated and how that wears on the emotions and what it does to your spiritual life when you cannot go to synagogue, cannot go to church. So, so this they were they were a distance. They were yelling because it couldn't be around people. And so, and so uh, maybe maybe this will help. Maybe if we illustrate this. I need ten volunteers. Ten. Raise your hand real quick. I need ten. I need ten. Come on, raise your hand. I see one. And I got two. I got two. I got three. I got three. I got four. Uh, three. I got four. I got five. I got five. I got six. 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 Seven. I got six. I got seven. Seven. I got seven. Six. Seven. Seven. I got seven. Then we got eight. We got a nine. We got one more. I need one more. Nine. Nine. We got nine. We got ten. We got ten. Okay. Ten. Okay. Really, what you want to do is very simple. I want you to be a leper today. Okay. Scratch and say, uh, and I want you to say with a loud voice. You're all at a distance. And say, Jesus, have mercy on us. Okay, go ahead. 
Jesus, have mercy upon Now, you're too close. Go down the hallway if you would, because at a distance. No, don't go down there. So, yeah, that's what they were doing. They were yelling to Jesus to have mercy upon us. Okay, now we, it's the Bible, okay? Okay, now we're, now we're, now let's just read this and, and, and just read it to the end, okay? So it says in verse 13, they raised their voice saying, what was it? Jesus, have mercy. You got it. Okay. And when they saw them, when he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. As it came about, as they were going, that they were cleansed. That means they were healed. It was gone. It was gone. It was gone. Wherever the body, they could. And so, and, uh, and they're going, they're cleansed. And one of them, when they saw that they had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his feet, at his feet, at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who turned back to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well, so there were there were ten that yelled, and one that turned back. Um, if we could just illustrate this whole thing one more time, the ten people that you yelled. If we could have one of them come forward, and the ten, uh, the rest of the nine, would you go to the priest, uh, the Queen of Peace is down the road, uh, Father Nick? Just show yourself to him; he'll get it; he'll figure it out. No, the, um, so there's just one. There's, there's one, where were the others? There was one, that, and Jesus, it's an understandable question, were there not ten that were cleansed? The other nine, where are they? You see, Jesus, was, Jesus had far more in mind than clean skin, far more in mind than a healed body. God had in mind, Jesus had in mind for that occasion, ten people not just healed, ten people having a relationship with himself who have discovered in their life for the first time who Jesus is. And that's the way it is with us. He's still trying to get this through to our brains that God has far more for us than simply to be physically well or to have friends or a new community. God is trying to bring us into relationship with him. And it's one of the tragedies of life now is so many people know all about God and they've received the benefits of God, but they do not know God. And in this case, a foreigner was the only one who knew better. I mean, it, 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 these are the people that, that were thought of as less important. They, they, they weren't as good as the rest. They were, they were just miserable. Listen, we don't do much better by percentages, do we? I mean, one out of ten, ten percent. I mean, we give God one day out of 365 days a year to give thanks to God for our country. One out of 365. And all of us had Thanksgiving, right? But if you think back to your Thanksgiving day, how many of the people gathered in your home by percentages actually gave, gave thanks to God? How many of you, how many of the people in your, in your community of people on Thanksgiving day we're actually giving thanks to God that day. I'll bet you it was maybe about 10%. And where were the rest? It's a good question. Because the rest were probably a little bit self-absorbed. Having a pity party kind of, kind of, kind of like a self-centered. Sounds like today, doesn't it? Now, many churches today, because of the holiday, last weekend or this weekend, will have sermons on gratitude. And they will tell all about how gratitude actually can improve your health. Grateful people are healthier people. Gratitude can actually have changes in your heart. Gratitude, did you know gratitude is good for your emotions? Gratitude will actually kind of pull you out of depression, make you more, a, a better, better, better emotionally. Gratitude actually makes you live longer and richer. Wow. And you know what? That might be true. But you, but you can have gratitude and a long life and health, but miss out on the conversations with Jesus. Because here's the deal. Given the choice between having a conversation with Jesus and being healed of incurable disease, way too many of us would take the cure of the disease instead of the relationship with Jesus. In fact, I think that given the option of something as simple as a brand new iPhone and a conversation with Jesus, I'll go for the phone. 
or, 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 or maybe, more, maybe, maybe if, if it was someone was offering free tickets to Vikings game, oh, I'm in. But a conversation with Jesus, or someone was saying a lower credit score, we can fix that right now. Oh, I'll take that because I can always go back to have a conversation with Jesus. So we'll just grab the stuff and we'll put God back, God, God off. And we got problems that are far worse than our credit score, far worse than leprosy. We got problems these days. I just checked on the internet that source of all truth. I checked what do people say are the big problems of today? What's the election? What are the issues of today? And you can find lots and lots of surveys, but most of them will boil down to a, a collection that goes kind of like this. Our problems are health care, climate change, the economy, immigration, uh, refrigerate no, religion, religious freedom. I, I wrote that down. Uh, marriage, education. Oh, this one hits a bunch of them. Uh, destructive artificial intelligence. I didn't know that one. Apparently, I need to. And pandemic always gets in that list. I found a list that said the top three things that are wrong with the world, and they had nine listed. I'm thinking they forgot the problem of math. But we have far worse problems than politics and pandemic and immigration, economy, politics, social media. We've got a problem. It's a disease of the heart. And one of the prime symptoms of a disease of the heart is a lack of gratitude. We've got big problems these days. And one of the big indicators is we are not a grateful people. And we ought to be. And sometimes it's the people not like us that actually get it better than we do. I mean, so the people, the foreigners, the, not the people of God. I have pulled out a quote from Cicero in one of my readings. Cicero lived 50 to 100 years before Jesus. He was a Roman orator, a philosopher. And he said, he said this, In truth, O judges, well, I wish to be ordained with every virtue, yet there is nothing I can esteem more highly than being grateful. For this one virtue is not only the greatest, but is also the parent of all other virtues. And I think that foreigner was correct. For even if gratitude doesn't make you happier or healthier or richer, gratitude makes you a better person. And it makes you more like Jesus. And it gives us opportunities to have conversations with God we never had before. Well, perhaps you say, of all the problems in the world, do you really think we should be talking about thanks? I think so. And we've got problems. We've got problems that we didn't even know about. I found out about a problem just the other day I didn't know about. Did you read about it in the paper? It was, in, it was all over. The, I read Wall Street Journal had an article of, uh, called Bag Gate. Oh, this is true. I'll read it to you. This is perhaps the greatest controversy in the history of the sport of cornhole uh, a cornhole uh, turned up in August of 2022 at the Professional Cornhole World Championship in Rock Hill, North Carolina. Did you know there was a professional cornhole league? I, di I didn't either, but there was a problem because the number one seeded team was playing the number two seeded team in the grand champion, and there was $15,000 on the uh, purse, 15 grand. And so the second place team accused the first place team of cheating. Their bags are too small, they said. Well, this started a ruckus, and I'll read it to you. And so, so with the whole, this I'm reading Wall Street Journal, with the whole world watching professional cornhole live on ESPN, were you watching that? I was probably watching curling. <clears throat> Officials inspected the bags with great solemnity. Then they huddled near sponsor banners. Uh, Johnsonville sausage and Bush's baked beans and declared that it is true. The bags were too small. 
Oh, then the first place team said, we'll check the other bags, the other teams. And so they did. Guess what? All the bags were too small. <laughs> Told you there was problems in the world. It's coming apart at the seams. And by the way, why didn't anyone ever tell me I could be a professional cornhole player? They can make up to $250,000 a year. Now I got your attention. If I'd have known that when I was a kid, I would have practiced twice a day. I'd have, I'd have applied for a D1 college cornhole scholarship. Probably have that at Fond du Lac. I'm sure of it. I'd have skipped college altogether. I'd have gone pro right away. I'd have taken steroids for that. <laughs> Ugh, the world is so messed up. What's next? Professional pickleball scandal. I'm telling you, we got problems. And gratitude may not fix the the cornhole scandal, and it may not fix the economy, and it may not fix your health, and it may not fix politics, but gratitude will make you more like Jesus and give you conversations with God that you cannot have any other way. And gratitude is a foreign concept. So let's talk about gratitude. Being grateful means being different from everybody else. It simply means being different. And you know that because you're in conversations all the time. I, you know, the foreigner, the leper, the one that came back to Jesus, he wasn't special because he was bigger or because he was better looking or richer or anything else. He was called out because he was grateful. That's what made him different from all of the others, was simply a grateful heart. Born-again believers, followers of Jesus, are supposed to be different from everybody else in the world. And I don't mean we dress differently. We simply are different. I mean, remember these, these, these uh, well-known scriptures. Philippians 2.15 says, Be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom... You appear, shine as lights in the world. That's supposed to be us. 1 Peter 2.9, you're a chosen people. You're a royal priest, a holy nation. God's very own possession as a result. You, should, you can show others the goodness of God, for he has called you out of that darkness and into his wonderful light. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by the changing of the way that you think. And then you will learn what to know what is God's will for you, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. And so we're supposed to be blameless and innocent and shining lights in a, in a twisted and a crooked, dark generation. And listen, they're, they're living up to their part of the bargain, aren't they? I mean, the world is crooked, the world is twisted, but are we living up to the bar side of the bargain we're called to be as innocent and blameless and light shining in the midst of it? Because being grateful, it will make you different, and it ought to. 2 Corinthians 6.17 says, Come out from among them and be different. Secondly, being grateful means breaking the social norms. This is harder than it appears. This one thankful person, if you think about it, society told him his cultural norm for him was to be out there far away, both as a leper and as a Samaritan. He didn't belong with Jesus or his people. Society says, you stay your distance. You keep over there among your own people. And he had to break through all of those social expectations and said, I've had enough. I'm going to be with Jesus. And all around the world, all around your world, the society is saying, leave God out. Because the world would be better without God and without the church and with all of that. And in order to be a grateful people, grateful to God, we're going to have to break the social norms that are being pressed upon us and say, I will not be bound by that which is broken. 
I will live the life that God has called me to live in the way that he has called me to live it. The whole world is, first they were abandoning the church and becoming the nuns, you know, where they don't belong to any church. What church do you belong to? None. Well, that's the largest group of people there are now who call themselves Christians. Now the big movement is abandoned God altogether. That's what society is going. That's becoming the norm. It's broken. The society and the norms are the Bible is old-fashioned. It's prejudice. You don't want to read that. I say the Bible is the word of God and it's right and it's perfect and it always was and it always will be. The world around us and saying the church, what do you mean, that old-fashioned place, that bigoted, prejudiced place where all those people pretend and the social norms says stay away, abandon that. But I say the church is the people of God with all of their imperfections and we're not there yet, but we're getting there by the grace of God. And so to be a grateful people, the people of God, we're going to have to bust through some of the things that are being pressed upon us and saying, this is what the culture expects of you. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God that we together, we may receive mercy and we'll find grace to help during a time of need. We need it now. And to come together into the throne of grace takes boldness to break away from what your society and your culture, wherever you live, is telling you. And by the way, if somebody who's rich and powerful or if somebody who wears a suit and has some sort of a position says to you, let's just stay away from church, let's just stay among ourselves, let's isolate, let's be far away and not go to that place anymore, I would say break that social norm and come to the feet of Jesus together with the people of God and worship God together. Thirdly, the being grateful means... Well, it means turning back. It means, it means turning. It means, it. well, there's ten people going this way. They were healed. Only one of them turned back. In the, we call that in our world repentance. Repentance means turning around. We call it repenting. And so, so gratitude is going to require that we do some repentance of the way that we were to the way we ought to be. And in the process, we can't hold on to that. You can't add Jesus to a, a, a world. You can't keep, oh, I'm going to grab Jesus and add him to what I, you turn around and abandon what was in order to embrace what is. And, and guess what? You, you lose something when you do. Because the other nine, where were they? Well, you can only imagine where they were. I mean, they had this incurable disease that was awful and isolated. They hadn't seen their wife, haven't seen their children, haven't hugged anybody, can't go to the village, can't go to dinner. And all of a sudden, they're cleansed, and they're got to be leaping and jumping and high-fiving and hugging and running into the village and embracing and, and a party. I'm guessing they all met at the pub and say, wow, we're free. Oh, this fella missed out on all of that. So, 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 so becoming a grateful person is probably, I mean, you're not going to get in on all that whining session. You're not going to be in the little social media complaint thing where everybody erupts into what we call viral. You're probably going to miss out on the coffee break room, you know, where everybody talks about everybody else as if they have all of the answers. Turning around means you miss out out. One of my favorite stories in the season yet to come, you know, Good Friday and Easter, it's, it's coming. And my, one of my favorite stories is Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. They were, they were, um, cold, they, they were in the society, they were, they were on the top of the, they were, they were, they were religious hierarchy. They had position, they had money, they had honor, they got all, they wore the robes and everybody looked it up to them. They had everything you could ask for in that society literally and they were believers in Jesus, but the Bible says they were secret ones cuz they didn't want to lose their little group and all that goes along with it. Until the day that Jesus died on a cross. 
And then Joseph, it says in Mark chapter 15, gathered up his courage. I love those words. Gathered up his courage and went before Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus and turned his back on all that goes along with being society's elite and the high-ranking and instead joined those who were worshiping a dying, a dead, and soon-to-rise Jesus Christ. You lose something in order to gain something you can never lose. And I don't know about you, but I'll bet you your friends are like a lot of mine. And all day long they sit in their whining in sessions and they complain about politics and they blame the president and they blame the reds and they blame the blues and they trash the church and they say this and they say that and you know what it means to become grateful is you have to leave that group of people you have to leave that world in order to be a part of the world that honors and glorifies God and gives themselves to Jesus Christ. Is it worth it? I'd say the whole world is waiting for enough people to leave them and start a different life. They turned their backs on the crowd and missed out on everything there but gained the only thing they could never lose. And finally, being grateful means setting aside former hostilities. I thought a lot about this, how... How one, one Samaritan, remember what I said about the Samaritans. Samaritans and Jews, they couldn't stand each other. L generational hostility between these people. Never talk to each other. Never go near each other. I mean, it was really bad. And here this one guy had to decide. Am I going to live in this hostility? Am I going to live in this separation? Am I going to make this my lifelong world where I am against those people? Or am I going to lay down those hostilities and all of my history and all of the hurt and the baggage? And am I going to go and form a relationship with Jesus who is a Jew? I'm convinced that the one thing that's going to start the healing in our country the repairing of all of the injustice and all of the criminal the criminals, all of the political uproar is when we somebody decides to lay aside the history, lay aside the past, and begin to be kind and show grace to the people around them. And that's what happens when you begin to be thankful instead of bitter and angry. You know, there's a great story in Luke chapter 13, just a few pages back. I love this story as Jesus is in the synagogue and he's teaching away as he normally does. And there's a woman in the, in, the, in the group who has bent over, not because of a sickness, but because actually a demon. For 18 years, she's been bent over. She can't look up. You can only imagine walking around for 18 years like this. And she's in the temple and it's the Sabbath day. And Jesus stops his teaching, touches the woman, straightens her up, and she's like, whoa! And people are starting to get happy right there in church. You're not supposed to be happy in church. But there's some people in there saying, oh, no, 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 no. We shouldn't be having that in church. This is Sunday. You go, you come back on Monday if you wanted that stuff. And they're all grouchy and nasty. Well, here's what it says. In verse 17, Jesus' opponents were being humiliated. And the crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things being done to him. And this describes the setting that Jesus lived in. Everywhere he went, some people getting grouchier and angrier and nastier and meaner. And some people getting hopeful and grateful and thankful and happier. And the question we have for you today is, which group are you in? Are you becoming today more joyful, more grateful, more peaceful? Or today, are you becoming like the rest of them? All upset about the world. All angry about the election all uptight about how things are being run around there and typing away on social media all of your well-thought-out opinions. Which group are you in today? What are you becoming? 
today, God's calling us to be more grateful, more thankful, more peace-filled, more joyful. And you might just find out a skin disease or two goes away in the process. Well, I'd like for the worship team to just to come back and help us to allow this to settle in. Being grateful means being different from the rest and breaking some of those social norms that we're, we're, we're in the midst of and turning back and turning your back on some of those pasts and setting aside the hostility that is between you and someone else maybe in your life. I had a conversation just yesterday with someone, a young man, who was um, saying how horrible the holidays are because of family. He said, they're toxic. He did. It's a Christian family, believes in God, and he's decided he can do better. He's one of these deconstruction people, and he's kind of left that behind. And, and, and guess who's toxic? I don't know if the family is, but I know him, and he's an angry guy. He's becoming more toxic, too. What would happen if instead of being angry and toxic, he would decide to lay the hostility down and walk to his family and thank them for something? What would happen in your life if you would lay aside some hostility and become grateful even to the people that you've held at arm's length. And maybe you're here today and that describes your life. And today we had communion, which is the very description of how God comes into our life and changes everything gives us the ability to love people that are unlovable. Set aside the past and embrace something new. And if that's you, today is your day to turn your back on what was and toward what could be. Maybe today you're going to become that grateful person that has a conversation with Jesus for the first time in a long time. Will you stand with me and let's just sing this song through. People are going to be in front, ready to pray for you. If that describes any of you, please come quickly to the front and just tell them, I need change in my life. If you'd like healing, you've got issues or problems or struggles, just walk on up. Right over there, right over there, someone will pray with you. So let's sing together. And I'll be back in just a moment.
said, I sought out to find the Lord, found him coming toward me. Yeah. God's been running after and chasing you far longer than you know. It's about time we meet him. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us so much that you would pursue us and find us. And in finding us, God, you offer us something we could never achieve, never gain, never hope for on our own. You've given us eternal life peace within and joy and a heart that's capable of gratitude. So help us to use this to be this, this, this light shining in a very dark world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great